Hi everyone, welcome back to the Soldiers of Cinema podcast for episode 26. Today we're going to be talking about Little Beater Needs to Fly. I'm joined, as always, by my good friend Clark Coffey down in California. How are you doing? I'm doing fantastic, man. How are you? I am good. It's warming up here, which is nice to know. And Springtime is kind of rolling around. Springtime's around. Yeah, it's beautiful here. I can see out into the Pacific Ocean ever so... Uh, ever so slightly. Uh, awesome. Catalina Island out there. It's a oh, beautiful, beautiful day today. We actually got some rain yesterday, so it clears up the sky. Things are, are nice and greening up. So, yeah, I'm, ex- and nice. I'm excited to talk about this film. Yeah. Uh, I, I know y- you had selected this the, the film for this episode, and you said that it was a film that you really enjoyed, and, mm-hmm. uh, and, and I agree. we're kind of actually going to be doing a little bit of uh, a, a double part. So we're going to actually talk about, of course, because Little Dieter, Dieter Needs to Fly is the documentary from 97 about mm-hmm. Dieter Dengler, who was um, a prisoner of war during the Vietnam War in Laos yeah. and escaped. Um, but then An amazing Herzog, story. Um, about a decade later, made um well a little less than a decade made a movie with christian bale rescue dawn right. about um dangler um so we're going to be doing that one next week and so. it, it'll be really interesting yeah you yeah. know we, we've we've never had an opportunity to approach the, uh, basically the same subject matter from both uh a documentary film and a narrative film now of course we know herzog always likes to you know uh manipulate and mm-hmm. uh you know do things in his documentary films that a lot of other directors don't do uh, it's one of the reasons that I love Herzog, frankly, uh, and we're going to talk about some of that as we go through this. But it'll be, yeah, it'll be interesting to see the same subject matter approached in two different films. Yeah, and compare the different, like perhaps there will be differences even in story. Yeah, of, absolutely. Uh, yeah. So, um, without further ado, though, um, yeah, let's talk, talk. So the, I mean, the film opens with um, probably a pretty pertinent uh, Bible passage, which is Revelation nine six. Yeah. Um, and that is, and in those days shall men seek death and shall not find it and shall desire to die and death shall flee from them. Um, so pretty pertinent to the fact that, you know, you're being and real pre- and, let's yeah, and not, real. Let's, and that's let's just, a good point course, to make. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Cause it, it's, it's actually, it is actually a real quote from the Bible, the, the, yeah. uh, King James version, if I'm not mistaken of the uh, Bible revelations nine, six. Now, you know, immediately when I saw this quote, because I've been kind of primed right from, mm-hmm. from a lot of other quotes that sub- qu- supposed quotes that Herzog puts in his films, I was like, wait a minute, I'm going to go look that up. Is that really a real quote? And believe it or not, it actually was which i was totally surprised by <laughs> yeah no yeah. It, and that's that's again it's one of those things that you're kind of you're almost more surprised when the quote's real i than, know uh, at least with herzog for sure yeah. and, and maybe um, it's it'd be a good thing too uh just before we hop into the film proper mm-hmm. um we could give like just a little bit of background for people on who dieter of course uh, yeah yeah dingler was and kind of you know hopefully you've seen the film if you haven't uh, we definitely recommend you check it out and maybe do that before you listen to this podcast uh because of course we will be discussing the film at length and detail mm-hmm. But just as a refresher for those of you who've seen the film or maybe you didn't have a ton of background on Dieter before, we'll just give a quick kind of overview. But um, yeah, Dieter was uh, actually born in Germany, so he shares that with Herzog. Very many similarities with Herzog, weirdly, as we'll get into. Uh, Yeah, 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 which is very interesting, right? And he he was born in 38 and he grew up uh, in a a post-World War II Germany. So uh, obviously uh, a pretty difficult childhood uh, Germany was just devastated during the war. And, um, uh, yeah. And so he grew up in Germany without much. He, uh, wanted to be a pilot. He claims that he saw this, this plane flying over his village, strafing his village, like it came right, two feet from his house. I, yeah. <laughs> right. And the plane pulled up just two feet away from his house, which, you know, you know how we are, you know how we are. It's our memories of, of childhood are are sometimes maybe exaggerated a little bit in our minds over mm-hmm. time. But, this moment had a significant impact uh, on him, and he decided that he wanted to come to the United States and uh, and be a pilot, and that's what he did. Uh, after spending some time uh, learning a trade, he became a blacksmith, a clockmaker. Uh, he actually came to the United States, uh, joined the Air Force first. Uh, he came to New York, then signed up for the Air Force in New Jersey, and unfortunately... Uh, they didn't put him into a plane. They put yeah. him into the kitchen. So, exactly. <laughs> so he spent, I think, a couple years of time doing his service for the Air Force, completing mm-hmm. his contract. Two there. years total. Yeah. Yep. In the kitchen, 
When he was done with that obligation, he moved to California and then joined the Navy. Mm -hmm. And he actually did get to fly uh, in the Navy, and he did so in combat in Vietnam, where mm -hmm. he was unfortunately shot down, uh, held as a POW for about six months, uh, spent about 23 days uh, on the run after he successfully escaped. I think it was his second try. We'll get into that. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but then uh, then this film was made in 97. Uh, sadly, and we're going to talk about this too, because there's actually a couple slightly different versions of this film. Yeah. And, and in one of those films, there's a postscript. Unfortunately, uh, Dangler was diagnosed with, uh, and, and what is uh, ALS. Yeah. ALS, so, and, uh, yeah. which is an, an degenerative brain disease. Yeah. yeah, a neurological disorder. And sadly, on February 7th, 2001, uh, he committed suicide. Um, mm -hmm. And so the, the funeral, he was uh, laid to rest in Arlington Cemetery uh, with full honors. And that uh, part of that service uh, is in a, as a postscript in one of the versions of the film. Yeah. So there's of just course, a little bit. Of course, the film released in, uh, in um, 97. 90, 97, which was before his death. So it would have been added on after. Added on. And um, it's a Which rare... is also another interesting thing to kind of mention that his health must have deteriorated really quickly because yeah. the film was shot 97, 96, I assume. Yeah, he didn't and live long after. And by 2001, he was in a wheelchair. Yeah. Um, so clearly yeah. his um, health kind of rapidly deteriorated after the film. It's, which is yeah unfortunate and i don't you yeah. know I, I i i'm not sure i can only speculate i don't know if he had any kind of inkling or symptoms of this disease when he was shooting this film with herzog yeah. if maybe that was a an impetus to get the film made that mm -hmm. maybe he knew he didn't have much time i'm not sure um but certainly that postscript uh and and this knowledge of his uh being diagnosed with a terminal illness and then uh c killing himself Definitely gives a different gravity and and more gravity to that quote for sure, um, but mm -hmm. uh, but yeah. So there's a little bit of background for, with that, and uh, and like uh, Cullen says, we start off with this quote that's actually a real quote, which is real amazing. Quote. <laughs> and then we find ourselves in a tattoo parlor. <laughs> it's like yeah, and so this is a... yeah, I love this... it. It's weirdly related, um, as we sort of discussed briefly before. Yeah. Um, that so of course the quote is about you know men seeking death and not being able to get it and stuff which obviously right, it's would, about would, the would angels be that... for when you're in the prisoner of war camp and wanting to die right. but you're not dying but then you know we immediately come into this tattoo parlor which at first you're kind of like what's going on yeah the kind um, of a non sequitur just a but tad. it's um but it's uh Dieter is describing this hallucination that he had of what i think is supposed to sort of almost be like the four horses of the apocalypse which is similar to his message of you know the revelation nine six um and he's talking about uh, he's kind of giving the like it's it's almost it sort of comes off comedically because he's almost like giving this tattoo artist notes on what it should look like because he saw it in real life. Right. And so right. he's like talking about this mythical the like these mythical beings. angels like, of no, the no, no, that wasn't what they looked like. They looked a little right. bit different than that. And he's kind of describing, oh, no, no, they came out of like whatever trees versus clouds or whatever. so it's kind of a funny little bit in and a way kind of, yeah it's a great way to introduce you to Dieter though because he is he is like kind of a quirky person like he's, he's got, definitely he's got a quirky quirks. person he and um, he definitely has kind of a sense of humor about him for yeah. sure especially yeah. considering the topic you know the subject matter and you know it's interesting that you mention that because I think throughout the film um I, you know I, I almost wonder you know how much different this the subject matter would have been had you know, Dieter been a different kind of personality. I yeah. mean, it's or how the... different he'd have been if he wasn't he'd gone through it, right? Sure, sure. Yeah. It's just I, I almost wonder if if this would have just been overwhelming had he also been kind of darker or you know presented this in a much yeah. more somber way. It's almost kind of the the matter of fact and factness, or even sometimes the lightness with which he tells a lot of his stories almost maybe makes it bearable to listen to because and a lot it, of it is so graphic and I would I would I would gander that he gander a little choice or you know a, right. a, an inference that perhaps the way that he talks about it is his own coping mechanism that Could he be. does talk about it matter because I know that that's sort of a thing in a lot of like trauma post traumatic yeah. um psychological disorders is that people will talk about them just as though they are facts somewhat removed so that they somewhat don't removed, exactly yeah. so they're almost like going through like a diagnosis like okay and then they put right you know they did this to me then they did this to me then they did this to me they came over here did this and it's sort of less um emotionally strange it's just too it. much it's too yeah, much I, to I dive totally into agree too that deeply had, 
had yeah. somebody else being the subject of this movie about which like the similar subject matter had been you know kind of taken um i'd be curious to know how depressing it is it's not a very depressing like it's not no as, it's as dark as the subject matter is it's not really that right depressing or dark of a movie and and, um, and so much of that rest on you know the uh, Dieter's and i'm going to call it a performance if you will because and yeah. we're going to get yeah, into yeah. this as we get through more of the movie but i mean he was definitely coached and rehearsed uh, by Herzog and you know even some of these scenarios were entirely manufactured by Herzog so I'm definitely going to go ahead and I'm going to call it a performance but uh, but yeah if there would have been a radically different type of performance you know if quote unquote like if they would have been really reaching to pull the heartstrings if they would have you know it I, I think it would have probably been an unbearable film to watch frankly um mm -hmm. and so i think a lot of that is owed to to dieter's performance and you know and... speaking of which it, you know it's it, it's we're then we we kind of jump into uh dieter driving to his home yeah and and mm -hmm. and he's we have this little moment in the car he's in this beautiful it looks like maybe a 40s maybe like mid to late 40s or early 50s automobile i'm not yeah. an expert on that era of cars but you know he's driving down the road in california and he talks about how he can still hear the voices of his dead friends on occasion in his head. And, um, and I, I think he's, he talks about how he can still hear like one of the, the men that he was in the, one of the, the POW camps with talking about how he is so cold and that mm. he keeps the convertible top up on his car, even when it's nice outside, because he's kind of haunted by this, this voices of being cold of his friends being, yeah, cold. or we'll put the air conditioning or the heat on if it's, if it's like a hundred degrees out. Right. Yeah. And, and it makes me, and I wonder because, you know, we jump from that to uh, Dieter at his house, he's coming home and we have this this kind of the scene here where Dieter is opening and closing the doors of his car. He's opening and closing the door of his house. And mm -hmm. we go, walk into his house and right in the walkway, the entranceway there, there are all of these paintings of open doors. And Herzog yeah. tells us that, you know, uh, well, actually, Dieter tells us himself that it's like important to him. It's like that to, to know that he can open and close a door is something that most people take for granted. But if you've ever been a prisoner like he was, you know, the fact that he can open and close a door at will is so important to him that he constantly is doing this as he goes through life. And of course, we know because Herzog's told us that, guess what? That's totally manufactured. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And didn't Dieter also say that it was completely made? Like, yeah, didn't yeah. Dieter they both say that, you know, that the paintings were just paintings or whatever the, the paintings were just like he found them at a thrift store and yeah. you know of course it's like you know you and i will never know for sure how exactly how the creative decisions kind of came to be but i can also almost imagine right i just like hypothesize for a second you know herzog's there he comes into dieter's house he's kind of looking around right you're we've all done this you're on location you're looking for you know where are some hooks that i can kind of you know uh, hook into this story what you know yeah. what's yeah. jumping out at me and yeah, i can just imagine herzog goes into his house and immediately he's confronted with this series of, of quite frankly gaudy you know paintings not yeah. exactly nice looking paintings almost look pastel in a pastel way pastel like and, and a yeah. bit amateurish yeah, yeah yeah i can totally imagine those being at a thrift store you know but yeah. uh <laughs> hey i've got my own fair share of thrift store art in the house so oh, absolutely. You know, i'm great. all down for <laughs> great that. places to yeah. go <laughs> for sure but uh you know i can just imagine herzog is like oh I've got it, you know, you should be doing this because you've got the great accent. But it's like, you know, <laughs> oh, yeah, okay, whoa, you had, why do you have uh, Herzog's? Like, why do you have all these paintings of doors on your wall? Oh, because I just found them at a thrift store. They were cheap. No, I've got a better idea. Yeah, it's do because... you think that it's because you yeah, were in prison? <laughs> You're right, it's like, oh, it's because the open door, like, has so, you know, it, it, it symbolizes so much for yeah. you that you're now free. And, you know, you had your freedom taken away once and now you're free. But, I mean, it, it, it's funny because, you know, if you look at this, like, you know, in hindsight now that this was a manufactured moment, it's almost kind of funny in a way, because, you know, you know, when when Dieter pulls <laughs> up in the car, right, he gets out of his of the driver's side, which is the car, the side of the car that's furthest away from camera. He gets out of the car and he doesn't have to open and close his door a bunch of times like someone with OCD would. He not a problem. He gets out, close the door. He walks around the car and it's the passenger side door, the door that is actually, you know, facing camera. 
It's like it's a performance. You know, he opens and closes that door. He just got yeah. out of the car. He didn't do anything to his door, but he has to do this door. And it's like you can tell it's like it's a performance for the camera. Well, even the moment when he when he goes in, he, he opens the door a few times and he walks into his house and closes <laughs> it. It's it's sort of funny. It almost seems like he's just it closing does. the door and like being like, all right, bye, guys. Because then he comes back and opens it and sort of comes right. out and is like, isn't I that great? Isn't that wonderful? It would look weird to other people, but I love it. And it's like it's very much. But I also can see. Dangler, like just just judging off his personality, that I feel like Herzog and Dangler really got along I in bet. the way that Dangler was probably like, "Oh, that's a great idea." <laughs> like, I'll, I I'll do that. I bet. I mean, um, and you look at it. She shows a lot of enthusiasm in the way that he's like doing he these little bits that they're kind of uh, coming up with. I so. mean, he definitely does not seem like a uh, you know. A, uh, he doesn't seem like uh, that he, he he definitely seems like he's in it. You know, he's here. He, he's like, it's not a reticent kind of performance. I mean, I feel like he really is there and wants to do yeah. this. And I, I yeah. do get a sense that he I mean, because think about the sense of the sense of kind of play that you would have to have to do a lot of these things. I mean, later in the film, we'll talk about it. But, you know, Dieter is actually taken back by Herzog to Vietnam and, and Thailand. And he's put in places that very closely represent uh, these very traumatic moments in his life. And, you know, Herzog goes and hires locals to to kind of pose or, or, or replay yeah. some of these scenes. And, you know, I mean, you definitely, you got to give it to Dieter. He, he's definitely open to this experience and he's clearly got a sense of kind of, I get the, I mean, the best phrase I can kind of use is like a sense of play, right? A willingness yeah. to be a part of this. And so, I, of course, it's one of those things I'd love to be there and, you know, I would have loved to have kind of seen how did Herzog, do, you know, gain Dieter's trust? How did he work with him as a as a person to kind of understand, you know, as Herzog is always talking about, you know, how vital it is to understand the hearts of men. Um, of course, I mean, interestingly he, enough, clearly, too, Dieter did not fear death when he returned because he became a test pilot and survived right? like four subsequent qu subsequent crashes right? as well. So it's amazing. Um, it's, yeah, it's one of those things to me where it's like it almost perhaps in an odd way and in kind of an inverse way that happens to a lot of people that have really traumatic, especially wartime experiences. He, it, it almost had a freeing sense for him right. where he almost like r was removed from the sense of fear of death and removed from this sense of like constraint in his life. And, and, and very much at least again, the impression that I get from him um, is that he kind of opened up and decided to kind of live a looser life afterwards in a, in a good way. And yeah, um, which I think is really interesting. We certainly I also, lived a full life, I think, which yes, is fantastic. Exactly. But I, yeah. And I, yeah. So it's Herzog really taps into that. I think a lot, yeah. you know, even though a lot of this is coached, a lot of this is manufactured and kind of put together by Herzog. I, at least I, at least I feel if it, if it isn't representative of Dieter's actual personality, well then the character they created together really works for me. But I mean, I feel yeah. a strong sense of personality and a sense of, understanding uh Dieter in a in a important way his personality and makeup definitely comes across to me in this film and perhaps the most you know one of the more real moments of the house thing is showing his food supplies which would make sense oh, he's kind of right. got like a and he almost again he sort of almost pokes fun at it as well like he's not he like some doomsday prepper where he's like yeah. I'm going to need this in 4 years when the Russians take over yeah. he just kind of says like I would I just sleep better knowing it's down there. I'll probably never have to use it in my life. And it's right. it's very, you know, he's very laid back about that he's got these again, that's kind of why I use the term quirky because he's got these like quirks to him that but he's are kind really of, interesting, but he's very much self-aware of them. He is. He um, is. I, he, I just and I want to point something out too. It I have to. I have to because it and it it says by all means. I mean, I, it's easy for people you're on camera, you know, you kind of misspeak, but it, it's just a fun tiny little like oh, trivia yes. tidbit that I want <laughs> yeah. to talk about in the where where we're going through Dieter's house. Uh, it, which is interesting already because it's very casual and Herzog is just, kind, you know, Dieter's kind of leading Herzog around the room uh, mm -hmm. with the camera and just kind of talking about his home and we're kind of checking it out. It's very casual, but he opens up the back door and we see his porch out the back and there's this model of a an airplane. Yeah, quite a, a large model too. Quite yeah. A, yeah, quite a large model of an airplane that's out there kind of standing on a post out in, in his backyard. And it's interesting that... Um, Dieter miscategorizes the plane. He calls it a P-51 Spitfire. Yeah. And, and of course, there there is not a P-51 Spitfire. There was a P-51 Mustang that was made by the United States, and there was a Spitfire, which was a British plane. Mm -hmm. Both were both were World War II fighters. 
Um, but as you correctly noticed, it, it's actually a Spitfire. It's a model of Spitfire. But even more so, you noticed that the credits handle this in a really kind yeah, of... The or not the credits, I'm sorry, the uh, subtitles are, handle are, it. Yeah, tell us about that. So, so the subtitles say... So it was one of the things that I kind of noticed that he had misspoken, that it sounded right. like... I, I couldn't... It's hard to catch, but he sort of says like, you know, it's a P-51 must, Spitfire. And he sort of corrects himself quickly, but it sounds like he's saying P-51. But in the the subtitles it says b51 which was an experimental bomber that never came to fruition right um but of course b standing for bomber um but yeah so it it's neither a p51 mustang nor a b51 but the <laughs> subtitles seem to reference that as b um but the subtitles also say b51 and then mus and dot 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 spitfire so clearly this whoever was doing the subtitles noted that he had sort of right. corrected himself there but um i just think it's an interesting bit because just a it's tiny like they, they also didn't get it right either it's that they yeah. said b51 when it's very much you know if it was a mustang it would be a p51 so a yeah little bit just interesting of course it doesn't fun. have any it's it's extremely <laughs> yeah. trivial but it's just kind of fun when you're analyzing these films and you're kind yeah. of a fan of them you know some people out there listening are probably like okay guys you're getting way too in the weeds right now and it's like <laughs> okay 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 yeah. i admit but hey we can do that once in a while we don't do it very often but just this once Mm -hmm. um yeah and then i mean as we're taking through the film here too you know we look at we get to learn a little bit more about dieter and his childhood and i think this is probably more biographical than i think i've seen you know herzog handle a lot of things yeah um, definitely more biographical than our the the grizzly man movie that we just right did. definitely um, more by now he i mean he does include uh you know biographical information bruce chatwin like you said grizzly man mm -hmm. um and, and and so i think you know to the extent he i think he's he's touching on this maybe more this time than in some other films because you and you brought this up and it's a great point there are a lot of parallels mm -hmm. between uh dieter and herzog and so you know maybe to some extent herzog's kind of coming back to his child uh, to dieter's childhood a little bit more because there's there's these parallels that are probably very important to herzog i mean they both grew up in germany post world war ii germany immediately mm -hmm. after the war uh so obviously that that's going to have a profound impact and shape your life um so and maybe... they both sort of came to this realization of what they wanted to do late in their teens or, yeah, or right. kind of in their childhoods but with um, a burning passion but like yeah you with know, a bur exactly with kind of this destiny destiny both, almost yeah uh, idea of it where it's like this is what i have to do it also i mean they go into some really interesting elements about you know dengler's father was killed in the war um, right which comes back like to that. being important right i mean th this um, yeah that comes up later yeah comes up later it's we could talk about that a little bit i mean it's we've already described kind of the story that Dieter tells about, you know, watching the, the, the pilot uh, strafe his village, be wanting mm -hmm. to be a pilot. But, yeah, I mean, he tells a story about how his uh, I think it was his was it his father um, or grandfather Dieter's that was. Yeah. So there's great. His grandfather was his the grandfather. only person in his town to refuse vote to vote for, for Hitler yeah. in 1934. Right. Um which is interesting because he then he tells the story about his grandfather being kind of paraded around the town and forced into labor yeah. and basically ostracized from his community. And, and and so he describes, and of course this is later in the movie post Dieter's capture, but he describes this similarity between how he was paraded through the jungle yeah. um, and how he was sort of this objector to they, the uh, North Vietnamese said, if you denounce the um american State, yeah. uh you know military action in vietnam then i guess they never said they'll let him go but they basically just said they were trying to force him kind of to thing. right um and uh he refused and he sort of he sort of cites his grandfather's refusal to vote for hitler um as the you know if he a can do moment. that i can do this kind of thing yeah that gave um, him strength so it's just I, yeah. herzog does a good job of setting up these biographical details earlier in the film yeah these to kind of, that kind to of pay them off yeah. Life, yeah yeah it's um, an interesting thing too i you know We've talked about, you know, with with Bruce Chatwin and some of these other films um, where Herzog puts himself on camera, where Herzog mm -hmm. is, is more apparent in the interviews. We don't see any of that here at all, no. um, which no. is, is more indicative of Herzog's earlier films. I think it's not until later that we see him. Well, I mean, that's not true. I mean, we see him in in some films being on camera a lot but in this film he's not um mm -hmm. but he does and he doesn't ask a lot of direct questions there's not a lot of interviewing going on not too mm -hmm. much but but there is an interesting moment here where herzog asks um uh Dieter when we're still in his home you know he says what does it mean to be a war hero he mm -hmm. doesn't even ask art do you think you are or are you but he says what does it mean to be a war hero and Dieter says only the dead are heroes mm -hmm. definitely not a hero 
Um, so it's just one of the rare moments where we kind of hear Herzog outside of narration actually in the film. Yeah. So I just noticed yeah. that stood out to me that there wasn't a matter of fact, there's not a lot of narration for her from Herzog here either. There's a lot more of uh, Dieter's voice. Well, Dieter's film. a very interesting storyteller. And so yeah, that could perhaps be the reason that, yeah. that again, Dieter, I almost note similarities in my mind between the, our, our movie last week, uh, mm. My Best Fiend, and this mm -hmm. where it's like very much Herzog sort of, t and perhaps the reason that they were attracted together to each other and, and you know, were, were great working partners, Dieter and um, Herzog, not partners beyond this film, but I mean in this sure, film's in this context, film, yeah, yeah. Um, was because they tell stories in very similar ways. Like they almost... Yeah tell and of course uh, m plenty of that is likely because of the fact that Herzog was very much there to coach and um you know give notes on how he wanted these stories to be delivered to uh Dengler down to the point where at one point he makes him do like six different takes of the same story to get him uh right. to basically say the most efficient bo yeah. boiled down efficient story but but even then you know there's elements of just like when Dengler's walking around his house telling these stories or when he's walking around Lao um later in the film that there's very much, I do see a similarity between Herzog and um, Dengler's just style of, of storytelling and this like very almost specific anecdotal kind of style of like, it's not the bigger picture that matters. It's the specific little elements of the story that kind of build yeah. up this bigger picture, which I found was really interesting. Agreed. And I'm and so curious. Yeah. I'm so curious, you know, and of course we'll never know exactly. I mean, there are, and we're, well, there are definitely, um, there are scenes in this film where Herzog has very explicitly uh, shared with us uh, over the years that uh, it was either heavily coached, mm -hmm. uh, maybe partially scripted, or entirely manufactured. I mean, the the doors we discussed were manufactured. There's a scene um, uh, in the in the middle of the film where Dieter is in like this um, airfield or like a, a museum, and there's um. It, really interesting scene and he's uh he, he comes onto the plane and there's like a mannequin in a flight suit. yeah and a, yeah yeah and, which, we, like which is totally common right you go yeah. to these museums and they they have the planes and then they have the flight suit that would have been worn with that plane on a mannequin so you can get a sense of what that would have been like and yeah you know uh Dieter's describing the crash uh which is really compelling and he's talking about how you know he didn't have time to be scared it was only afterwards uh that he, that he you that you could be scared he's talking about this feeling of death being imminent and kind of floating and Herzog cuts to these jellyfish floating around. So it's like, even in this film, he's, he like found a way to work in animals, you know? Yeah. <laughs> like he's yeah, always, no, exactly. And it's like very reminiscent of, uh, of the fish. Yeah. Um, in oh, family I, and it's, romance. It's, yeah. Yeah. It's and, a really, I mean, again, and that, that was the, the through line that I saw very similar was the family romance moment when he's looking at the, the aquarium of yeah. um, the robotic fish. But this whole like, story apparently yeah. was, was kind of manufactured, you know? Yeah. Uh, I mean, Herzog was very much working toward a specific scene here, uh, working yeah. toward being able to fit this footage in with the deli jellyfish um, and this kind of analogy that the symbolism he was drawing to this feeling of like floating and death being imminent and kind of this, you know, removal from, you know, almost like this, spirit leaving the body or some kind and of perhaps thing like you know that. we'll get into we'll get into music in a little bit but there's yeah. there's you know very beautiful music here very orchestral which kind of contrasts with a lot of the, a lot of the other music in the um the movie of of there's like 60 different genres of music in this film which i love but, <laughs> yeah i mean of course um, this moment is kind of is is very much like accented by this beautiful yeah orchestral kind of almost hymn sounding music right um, as we see the jellyfish floating around in their and, and I mean, it's some... actually very effective because when yeah. I was sitting there watching oh, it, it, I was like, I could see death being like this, like uh, feeling like you're floating in a thing of jellyfish at peace. So that would be. It's it's really quite know, wonderful. I mean, sense. I think that's one of the things that Herzog, again, it's one of Herzog's great strengths. I feel like, you know, he uh, and you're right. The music that he chooses in this film, most of it, there's a little bit that I felt like I was surprised about that felt a yes. little bit different for yes. Herzog. Um, but I think by and large, it's music that we've kind kind of come to know uh it, to be in a herzog film but i think that you know i i just love his um a lot of times uh symbolism or analogies are drawn metaphors are drawn in film that are very on the nose they're mm -hmm. very you know it's like oh you you know i knew this was coming i knew this was coming and i love this kind of thing because it's like i would have never dreamed in a million years you know it, it that that you you know you've got this ex 
pilot, this ex-POW, talking about what it was like to have a near-death experience, and then we cut to jellyfish. It's like, that's, I love this, and it makes me yeah. feel things that I just, you know, I wouldn't, I, I, that yeah, if this unique. was like a History yeah. Channel, you know, bio on, on you know, Dengler, you would never, <laughs> you would never experience that, and I think that that is, as we are a Herzog podcast, I think it's kind of important sometimes to just stop and note why his movies are so special. Yes. And this is one of those this moments is... that I think really kind of exemplifies that is, is that Absolutely. I know, again, watching this movie and seeing that, you know, it's like these these empathetic moments that just put you right into the shoes of the character beyond just showing you footage of, of you know, which there yeah. is in this movie of napalm blowing up or whatever. Right. Um, there's this there's these beautiful moments where it's like I surreal and it's, it shows the genius of Herzog to go from, you know, again, knowing that the scene was manufactured. It shows the genius of Herzog to be talking with someone like Dangler, who would have described, I'm sure, it being like, you know, he probably just said, it felt like I was floating. You know, it felt like I was, when I was about to die, it felt like, you know, I wasn't scared. It felt like I was at peace. And Herzog probably made that connection and went, why well, don't we get you in front of the jellyfish? You know, well, I think, that, I, I mean, I, I, I think, you know, I've read that this actually, the majority of this entire section was, was kind of, that Dieter was pushed into describing it this way so interesting I think, okay yeah. I th yeah i think even further than herzog saying oh wait you know i really like your description of of what death kind of imminent death felt like you know in the editing room and he's like ah a jellyfish i think even further i think when he was working that's what i my understanding of it yeah, is. i, yeah, I could be could wrong be, yeah. but i my understanding was that this was actually a moment when you know herzog really kind of pushed dieter in a in a specific direction to describe this a certain way so, Which again makes a lot of sense because I, at the beginning, was going to describe, it slipped my mind, but I was going to sort of describe the element of how this is one of the rare examples of Herzog taking, you know, the same subject matter and making a documentary and then uh, yeah. a narrative picture about it. Right. But what I was going to say was in very much line with what Herzog talks about his documentaries is that they're not documentaries they're almost just different ways of telling that same story. Yes. Um, and well, so I could see Herzog totally writing a script out about this like kind of reading up perhaps even before he and this is all conjecture but perhaps sure. before he met Dieter and sort of said I really want this moment where he's crashing and these you know he, he relates to these jellyfish I would also be curious actually and this is something that again is totally um just off the top of my head but I'd be curious to know if Herzog actually was interested in making this a narrative film initially didn't have the funding for it yeah. so he decided to make a documentary first good question and then went on later on to make rescue dawn which was the like i wonder if rescue yeah. dawn was almost his original kind of focus or, or if it came up later after having done this movie and going this would make a really interesting um, it's really yeah I, i'll yeah. do some digging i'll do some digging you know because next week we're going to do rescue dawn and yeah. so i'll do some digging and see and you know and there may not be any information out there but I, absolutely i mean it could be he, he was doing the work on this film and fell in love with the story so much that he decided he wanted to tell it in a, in a mm -hmm. narrative feature film manner as well. Uh, could be that he had that idea from the get go. Could be that it was years later, you know, he's made this film. He thought he was done telling the story. And then, you know, it came to him after the, you know, maybe after yeah. Dieter's passing. And he thought, wait a minute, you know, I still want to work with the story more. There's still more that I want to tell. And yeah. who knows? Yeah. But clearly, I mean, clearly, uh, you know, spending the time and the energy uh, to create two feature length films about the same person, about the same subject, obviously had, you know, a significant impact on Herzog. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, so I, I think, you know, you talk about the the Herzog's genius in documentary and, and you, using the, you know, the jellyfish to kind of as one way to illustrate that. I think another way and it, that I really love to see in his films and i think it is so effective and it's something that i am absolutely going to utilize more in my documentary filmmaking is this this it's it's like kind of i don't want to say it, it's not it's a, like the the dramatic reenactments but it's with the actual subjects i love how mm. he mm -hmm. so you know throughout the film herzog is you know because they could have shot this anywhere they could yeah. have shot this anywhere. He could have had Dieter in his living room. It could have been talking heads. He could, but what does he do? He takes them back to Vietnam, and and they could have even just stopped there. You know, okay, we're back in Vietnam. Oh, let's yeah. you know walk the whole through thing the jungle. Could have been that bridge, little <laughs> right? Interview. It's like yeah. let's just walk through the jungle, and you can kind of show me like, oh, this is no. It's like he actually Herzog hires local extras. 
Um, I don't know if they were militia or, or just villagers, but I mean, he, yeah, we don't know armed. if those guns are real that they're, we don't know using, if those yeah. guns are real, but I mean, it, you know, and we're actually in these villages, um, that, that completely, uh, work as mock-ups or doubles for these prison camps. I mean, he's got Dieter bound and being marched through a jungle, uh, mm-hmm. you know, with a train of these militiamen. And this is really I, where you get the sense of Dieter's just kind of matter of fact, retelling of these events well to even be able to go through it i mean it but it it's you know i mean and and herzog is i mean it's very much you know he's placing dieter on the ground he's like having dieter illustrate show me how were you bound you know yeah um and 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 you can really see how this affects dieter and his storytelling i mean probably along with you know the rehearsals and the and he says you know he even he even mentions the point when they're walking through the forest he says like you can see my back but if you could see the front of me um, you would see like total fear on my face. Total like, he was fear, yeah. Having these PTSD flashbacks from right. reenacting, which, but again, that goes to such a testament of Dieter's character where he's still playing along, you know, that he's still, he doesn't yell cut. He, he right. works with Herzog he's, through this stuff, which is really, and he's sort of, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think there is a, a little bit of a throwaway line where he says, perhaps like this kind of helped me to work through it or something. I can't um, remember, but I, I feel like there's like a, surprised. it's a really small line somewhere where he just, or not, maybe I'm not necessarily working through it, but he sort of, I seem to remember there being some sort of like allusion to him saying yeah. that like, you know, perhaps this was, this was a necessary this was thing helpful. to face my demons. Yeah. 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 It's very possible. I mean, he um, does, he's got a, he's got a cute little aside, um, and I think uh, that I'll describe here, uh, you know, he, we're, we're now we're, we're in one of the camps or, you know, in a mock-up. We're in a village, but we're, Herzog is utilizing it to kind of represent the camp where he would have mm-hmm. been. Um, and there's this, this, this fun moment where uh, Dieter is telling a story about um, a villager trying to steal his wedding ring. He's been marched for a distance, and, and now there's a man with a machete who's threatening to cut off his finger and steal his ring. And mm-hmm. he's, tell, he's telling this story, and you know, Herzog's got this extra in the background. And it's interesting because this person doesn't have to be there. I don't you know. And actually, quite frankly, I'm like, why is this person even there? It, you know, if you think about it. It's a, he's just know, sort of he, sitting beside him. Yeah. He's just kind of sitting there chilling so so that in and of itself is kind of interesting but what it elicits after he tells the story is that Dieter leans over looks at this man and says hey it's just a movie don't worry about it yeah and by the way you've still got all of your fingers yeah because he sort of uses him to like mime the cutting off of the like he kind of tugs at the guy's hand at one point and yeah yeah, but again just like you said when he says that to the guard or the the man standing there You've got all your. He almost. It almost sounds like he's talking to himself, like that he was reliving this thing, and right. then sort of had to say to someone, "It's just a movie. Don't worry." And like it, it, makes it, it makes me think of when you know when I was a kid, I was really scared of roller coasters, <laughs> and I didn't start loving roller coasters until I went to a, a like a big theme park once with a friend who was even more scared of roller coasters than I was. Little Cullen and it, needs and was, to fly. Yeah, little Cullen needs to ride. The, the, <laughs> needs the, the to ride. Little Cullen needs to ride. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but no, it was it was this it was this like I think that's sort of where I get this almost like this psychological kind of um, again coping with him where he's almost saying to this other guy like don't worry it's okay and he's almost almost talking to himself projecting that to himself but i think actually my favorite moment of that scene though is how it ends Mm -hmm. how so he says that to the guy and then the camera just sort of walks away and goes over to this man cooking in the corner Mm -hmm. which is exactly as described in um in Dieter's story that there was a man cooking in the corner of this hut yeah and to me there's nothing said about it like it doesn't they don't go over and say that's what he looked like it's just this man cooking in the corner to me that it's such a brilliant way yeah, of having connects. that transition into like now you're sitting there going, this is what he saw. Yeah, we've gone from him rather than showing some sort of like uh, stock photography of villages in in Lao back in the day. Yeah, you just you just get it there and you kind of go, oh wow, we're here and this is we're what he here saw. and this is re- yeah, it's brilliant. And, and I, who knows? Again, I wouldn't be surprised if Herzog specifically said, oh, I want someone cooking in that corner, or right. if it was just you know sometimes things like that just happen and there are those magical moments. Yeah, um, yeah, but. Uh, but, but either way, it's no less effective. Well, either way, and I agree, it's fantastic. And all yeah. there are so many of these subtle and not so subtle. But I mean, Herzog just the the he has manipulated so many of these aspects of how he's made this film, and that you've gave you've given a great example, a seemingly small thing. But mm-hmm. you're right. It I think it really brings the immediacy and the gravity of Dieter's stories to life. 
and it's a really powerful way to to use the visual mm-hmm. in film. And I think a lot of times in documentaries, it's you know we don't see it done in this way, uh, especially when we're talking about a historical thing. We're we're looking at historical footage or recreations, or so. This is I feel like. Uh, one of the many things that Herzog does uh, somewhat uniquely, I think many, some people are doing this more now, but just so exceptionally effective. Um, and uh, I, I love to see it. I love to see it. I'm going to steal more of that. <laughs> I'm going to steal more yeah, of this in no, my it's, films. It's, yeah, it's incredible. Way, it's just an incredible way of storytelling and getting the audience engaged. Yeah. Um, it reminds me, strangely enough, of Shoah, um, the documentary of the Holocaust, which is it's famously uses no archival footage. Mm. And it's like sort of to me that that is such a brilliant way to yeah. um, to do these types of stories, which is without using archival footage or you're putting the people. And which Herzog does use here. I mean, there, yes, is, yes, archival there is archival for, footage, yeah. but it but it's you know, he, he's using all of the tools here. And right? I would almost say that the the brunt of the storytelling aspects by Dieter are just Dieter speaking. Yeah, um, that the archival footage tends to be over kind of the bridges section of like the moments of, of yeah. here's now, now here we, here's where we are kind of thing in the story. Right. Um, but then we get to the, perhaps the darkest moment, but again, not dealt with in some sort of like doom and gloom, you know, Dieter prying to the camera kind of way. It, it's when they get to the camp again, he matter of fact goes through, they're kind of at a mock up of what the camp would have looked mm-hmm. like. And they've got this hut that he describes them being tied down on the, um, the uh, uh, the porch and that his feet are in the same device that their feet would have been in, where it's like they put their feet in this thing. Yeah, that yeah. It's kind of like one of those shackles, you know, old yeah. faction, yeah, wooden shackle type things. Um, and and he describes, you know, the horrible, you know, inhumane uh, conditions. One man holding his intestines. Um, yeah, and then you another prisoner. I, I yeah. forgot this, but the guy with the rusty nail that uh, was digging out, you know, abscesses. the pus from abscesses yeah. from his from his, you know, where his teeth used to be. Oh. So disgusting. Horrible, uh, inhumane conditions that um, Dieter says that he was at first almost glad to be in because he didn't have to travel anymore. Right. But then slowly realized that there was this, you know, they, the the awful conditions of just people sitting on a porch for three days straight in their own, you know, he knew he would and, die. And yeah. I mean, like he'd that, been through so. so much at this point, too. I mean, yeah. it, you know, by the time we get to this point, you know, he's been a prisoner. He tried to escape. He was recaptured when he finally had to uh, find food and he was captured at a watering hole. He was marched for a period of time and tortured. Yeah. Now he's back at another camp. Um, and uh, I, I mean, I think it's like clear to everybody at this time, probably, look, we're going to die if we stay here. And we may die when we if we try to escape, but we're definitely going to die here. <laughs> yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, and it and uh but it's I, I these moments are so amazing. He and then we we kind of cut, he he tells the story there, um, you know, of of escaping and having to kill. I think he had to kill five guards because mm-hmm. uh, they yeah they they basically use their meal time to break out and get guns and yeah you know. they, no and, shoes and, though they no they, shoes again, that's it, that's the important part they couldn't <laughs> find their shoes couldn't find is, any shoes but yeah. I just I mean the, the the story of course in and of itself is extraordinary I mean it's very few people escaped alive from these kinds of situations I mean very very well very yeah few. we we lo- I looked it up before and it was it, there was I think I think they said seven people or or maybe it was something. So seven, very some small amount number. Of, very small amount of people actually escaped, and only two survived. So very Dieter. exceptional. So Dieter and one Thai civilian actually, and that's not that's not just this event. That's in yeah, the entirety the of the war. Yeah, um, so, only two people survived escape from these. Uh, so camps. C- clearly an exceptional story. Um, yeah. But uh, and just harrowing. He talks about how you know Dieter talks about how escaping with his friend Dwayne, somebody that he had grown closer to than anybody else in his life to that point, having gone through all of this together. Yeah. Um, uh, and and they he t- it's just I mean extraordinary. And we're, I know that I, I've seen Rescue Dawn, so I know some of this is in there. But and we'll we'll cover that in our next uh, episode. But how his friend unfortunately was was murdered while he mm-hmm. while they were on their way out to escape by by a villager. And the fact that Dieter made it, and this is this was an interesting uh, setup too. I, I I don't I hardly know what to think of this in some ways. I want to talk with you about it, you know. So so uh, Dieter's talking about how he finally escaped and and mm-hmm. how he is um, picked up by uh, Eugene Dietrich, uh, who is a another pilot, and we're here now at a reunion that Herzog has staged with Eugene and Dieter. <laughs> They're in this like dining room, which There's must a... be 
Dietrich's. I always thought it was I don't Dietrich's know. house or who something. Knows? But, uh, who yeah. knows? Very we don't fancy. Know. Like they've got like a butler there. It's and really stuff. fancy. Yeah. It's a really fancy house. And yeah. there's this huge turkey, this huge, like perfectly cooked turkey. I'm talking yeah. like a 15 pound turkey, right? Mm-hmm. For the two of them. <laughs> for the two, it's just those <laughs> Seemingly two. Seemingly for the two of them, yeah. Dieter, Dieter is in black tie. He, he yeah. is in black tie. Uh, uh, Dietrich is in uh, a suit. I think like he's got I like can't... a pipe, and he's got a yeah, he's it's got, got a, a pipe. turtleneck, a very nice a, white yeah, turtleneck under yeah, it. Yeah, 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 and a and a and a jacket, and yeah, and, yeah. and and uh, supposedly this is the first time that they've seen each other in a long time. So Herzog has staged this, but it's it's uh, it's surreal. It's and I and I love it. I said I don't know what to kind of think about it in some ways, but I it just works. It somehow it works. You know, yeah. when you break it down kind of analytically, you're like, wait a minute. That sounds weird. This but, is yeah, just yeah. weird. Why does what does any of this have to do with anything? But then when you kind of think about it, I mean, you know, sitting down to share a meal, Thanksgiving is about gratitude. Mm-hmm. Um and, and and it actually really kind of makes sense in a way. Uh yes, it's a bit surreal, uh, but it actually really works. And yeah. I, just, I just love this kind of creativity. But I just, when I first saw it, I was like, what? <laughs> yeah, it's 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 really a bizarre... And again, I think the more bizarre moment is just that it's the two of them with this big, like, this, this big, this really fancy turkey. house and this huge turkey that Dieter winds up cutting. But um, <laughs> that's where all the production budget went. But <laughs> there was, yeah, yeah. Was but, that but, single turkey. But, but this um, is, I mean, all of these things, you know, it's like there, there's so much of these interesting. We've got the jellyfish scene. We have yeah. this scene. We have a lot of the, you know, the uh, Dieter being coached and the manufacturing of these stories. But we've talked about this so many times, This the difference between fact and, and truth. Truth, exactly. And I yeah. think when we get through to the end of this film, there is, I, I think the film was very successful at at illustrating some truths about yes. Dieter and humanity as opposed to just this biographical kind of list of facts and again and that's what's so so like again we can go back to the moment where it's the six different takes of the the, the description of Dwayne's death yeah and how he kind of describes Herzog describes actually in the master class how he was going on about like these specific points of like and then he hid behind well, his first tree, take and was like, like 30 minutes yeah, yeah and then he was like and then he was yeah. talking about how he jumped from bush to bush to get away and then yeah. he was like no no just tell but i think one of the points that herzog in, at least in the master class kind of says that he wanted in there was about the the shoe the the one sole of the that shoe was that important had to keep swa- i yeah. think herzog actually specifically told him like i want that to be got to focus on the centerpiece that. was that you guys were yeah. swapping this single sole of a shoe yeah back and forth um and that you know, perhaps this goes into this idea of like the machinations that after his friend was killed, that he kind of went robotic yeah. about survival was that after he says Dwayne, he didn't. So after, Dwayne yeah. was killed and that he, Dieter describes that he didn't even remember grabbing the sole of the shoe off of his foot. But right, then suddenly just, while he was running, he realized that he just, he, he grabbed it. And that was yeah. like this, this, that, that in that exact moment, it was like a split second thing where his brain stopped feeling emotion. It stopped feeling worry or fear or pain or whatever. And he just became this, this machine designed mm-hmm. to survive until he got out which i think is really quite something because that also to me alludes to the fact that that was also the moment where he was probably most acceptance of his death probably that he yeah. was walking along with this bear and he describes that this you oh, know it's that a this bear see- to moment, him represents yeah. you know he says that this bear represented death and that in that moment much you know very uh, so similar to the jellyfish kind of description that right. i i almost um confused the two but um that he describes that he says this bear was like my only friend and that in that moment he didn't see death as something evil or bad that he saw death as this kind of all accepting force. like it was the yeah the only thing he had left yeah. was this and, yeah um, and so i find that really and that this bear was you know he knew that this bear was waiting for him to die but at and the same again time, i just wonder it kept him going i just wonder oh, yeah i just wonder you know was that Herzog? Was that Dieter? And again, yeah. you know, yeah. it doesn't matter ultimately. And I, the reason I, I, you know, I kind of always have these moments where and we talk about them here, where I wonder, you know, is this Dieter? Was this Herzog? Whatever the film may be, I'm wondering. Of course, in reality, when I'm watching these films, I don't care. You no, know, I, no. I don't care if this is an actual event that occurred to Dieter or if it was something that they made up together or if it's something that Herzog made up entirely on his own. It doesn't matter to me at all. Well, to it's me, it's the same as 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 changing things in a narrative film that is based on truth, where it's like, are there yeah. more efficient and more pertinent ways to telling the story that get the point across? Better? Absolutely. You know, if, or get if to if a the, deeper like perhaps, truth. you know, perhaps there was not really any bear, but that 
that include the inclusivity or the inclusion of that bear as this symbol of death is exactly that it's a symbol of death right it's and it's, an a, it's almost a personification or i guess an animalification of yeah. um of the feelings that uh the physical manifestation of the feelings that Dieter was feeling and so i think that to me just like you were saying makes it work better regardless of whether or not it's true um and in terms of even just like the technical elements of this film very you know pretty typical for herzog the mm-hmm. the cinematography is beautiful but very um simple simple it, effective um, but simple herzog so has very little spoken narration which um, is unique which is a little unique. yes that is we, that is unique in terms of his his technical sides of his um Generally, you know, Herzog, we have course, a lot more narration. His, his yep. narration. But I get a sense that we like we've talked about so many times. I get a sense that to great extent he's speaking through Dieter. You know, yes, I, I yes. really get a sense of that. Absolutely. Um, and so that makes sense. You know, that I think he felt a kinship with Dieter, and I think uh, I think he's using Dieter to speak. Yeah. So makes yeah. sense. Yeah. And so, but yeah, and and it, it you know again, much like a lot of the other Herzog films too, um, shot on film, long takes, kind of wider lenses, a mm-hmm. lot of handheld photography. Yeah. Um, but not shaky. I mean, I think I think that's kind of one of my big distinctions too, and that's something that I've taken a lot from Herzog in when I'm doing something. I don't have sticks. I, you know, I primarily shoot on tripod, but when I don't have sticks, my handheld photography is very much taken from Herzog's, which is designed to be as smooth as possible. And I don't like using gimbals. I don't like using mm. stabilizers and things like mm-hmm. that. I, I stay away from those things. I find that they look too mechanical and digital. Um, but you know, if I'm carrying again, you know, you people on the podcast can't see it, but I've got my, a very big camera behind me. If I'm carrying that handheld, <laughs> very big, it's I, about as big I as a car, car, from yes, what I hear. Yes, it's, it's one of the old '30s Mitchell uh, <laughs> cameras. But um, but no, I mean that's that's kind I've of what I love very about Herzog's thing is that there's they're running through the jungle, and Herzog specifically mentions again one of these things that he mentioned in the master class was when he was searching for camera operators, um, the people that could stabilize the image with just their hands and he tells that story about when he was mm. going through the glacier and that the mm-hmm. guy could stick out his whole arm and just use his body weight to stabilize right. the, the camera and it's very similar to here where it's like they're running through jungle but it's not shot in a way that you know it's not like this kind of michael bay crazy action cam where it's like Peter's right. running through the jungle with these guys with guns and we're shaky cam close-ups of his face and the sweat pouring off no it's just kind of the camera is on right. someone's shoulder well, and they're just following and it's I very mean, well, you know, it'll be interesting. It, and I, I, you know, I, I am going to be interested to kind of compare this because, of, you know, uh, Peter Zeitlinger uh, shot this film. He also yes. shot Rescue Dawn. Mm-hmm. So yeah. it's going to, and it, of course, Peter and Herzog work together on many films. I, yeah. I can't remember exactly off the top of my head how many, but many. And so it'll be really interesting to see uh, the, the cinematography work here in this documentary uh, and then go into Rescue Dawn and see the narrative representation of that. It's going to be really interesting. But um, but I, I agree. It's it's effective. And, you know, Herzog, all, I mean, all of his hel- films have a physicality to them. I mean, so many of them are shot in these, you know, difficult, challenging environments. Of course, this one's no different. Yeah. Um, so there's definitely a physicality to it. And it makes perfect sense that Herzog would look for somebody, you know, that has a physicality about them to be able to do this. But mm-hmm. Yeah, and as we kind of briefly mentioned before, the music, um, very typical of Herzog in a way, but with also exception again, of a couple pieces, with exception, yeah. exactly. There's, there's, so a lot of you know, like Wagner, classical, but also there's Siberian Bach, throat Dvorak, singing. Yeah, um, there's, um, there's, there's like in the mood with Glenn by Glenn Miller. There's all these different uh, types of music, which is quite typical for Herzog. But there's one moment that you pointed out that I went back and listened to again. Mm right um you know and again correct me if i'm wrong but right following the description of um Dwayne's death correct and yeah. it's it's almost and i sort of described it um you had a bit of a different feeling from it but i sort of described it almost as like it sounded to me almost like a, a military funeral march um or something like that but an older one not like taps or yeah. something but sort of it, almost like an old it felt like, kind of hollywood to me yeah which is it felt rare. very hollywood and, it, and very sympathetic almost um, yeah it just felt you know it's like i mean obviously music is used in in many different ways in film but it's used to like often it's used to to kind of i mean 
the worst way to be that I guess the worst way I hear this, you know, the description of the worst usage is like when you tell the audience how they should feel. What to feel. Yeah. And and I'm not saying that that does that here. I'm not. But I think it's closer to that than I've Most I think I've ever Zog's seen in a documentary yeah. film for Herzog. Right. I mean, usually his music is kind of like this elevating like it kind of takes it's you like to a this part of the atmosphere surreal, yeah. yeah it's kind of right this you're it's such a contrast mm-hmm. that that it forces you that it's changing the images on screen where you're almost kind of looking at things in an alien way these landscapes start to take on you know we've got siberian throat singing going on you know behind Which, even though it's lao in cambodia and vietnam the right. story takes place in that it's got nothing to do with siberia nothing but to yeah do. you've got and i actually remember identifying that exact song because that siberian throat singing song which we haven't found the name of was this like big thing online like at the advent of youtube it was like this it was one of the first viral videos oh, and when amazing. it was playing i, I remember that hearing wow. it and going that's the exact that's wow. the exact tune that is in that like viral video at all so if you, i'm gonna if have you look to up, some, up some information yeah, on that if you if, yeah. you if you youtube search siberian throat singing it's the first result um, i'll be darned so so wow. yeah it's, uh, i you know again it's it's very so would that have been about the same music. time wait with, no this so would have been before so this was 97 that early, would have been around 2006 or so um, that the, the, the that 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 video was okay posted. so later so, so not yeah. yeah, so not that Herzog definitely didn't see it from you know okay. online and get it, but but it is just kind of interesting that yeah. it's it's clearly a more famous song from that that genre. Yeah. Well, it, we'll see I, if we can dig that up. Um, yeah, because I recognized it, and I don't know that, I don't know that music at all. <laughs> but um, but yeah, the, so the music all, all in all is you know pretty typical of Herzog with that those few exceptions, um, right. but also really lovely. Like very again crosses like fifty different genres, and I yeah. love that about him that it's not it's it's. It's utilized scene to scene what would be best for the scene and not trying to create some sort of soundscape for the whole movie that fits together like all classical or all Siberian yeah. singer. Yeah, he's like not that. worried about that at which all. I've, which I've and, I, and I've again, that's one of those things that, um, you know, even separate to Herzog, I've always kind of pushed for in my, my things is that I, I've never cared about the similarities of the soundings of, of the, you know, genres in, in yeah. music in my movies, which I love. Um, yeah. And then, of course, you know, the, the ending again is, is kind of different in both our versions um, right both the versions that we watched i kind of hinted where, to that right so yeah. the original version we end the, the film ends and i think it's really quite beautiful and and being a fan of of uh of flying and having kind of a passion for planes myself i can understand yeah. that a little yeah. bit um i've i have flown briefly i flew a little bit when i was a kid well, I, uh, yeah, piloting I have, yep i don't have a pilot's license now it's kind of on my on my list of things to do maybe down the Mm -hmm. road but my father was a pilot and uh i grew up around planes quite a bit and there is a magic to that for me so i i really relate uh Mm -hmm. to Dieter's kind of passion for this uh but we end in this beautiful he's um he's walking through this plane graveyard or plane store i don't know sometimes they're long-term storage but usually when yeah. you're when you've got jets sitting outside in the desert that usually means they're waiting to be they're scrapped. never gonna be yeah <laughs> but there's this giant again. yeah because they degrade pretty quick out there but um but you've got this just this you know acres and acres and acres of planes mm-hmm. the camera and, pulls back and you and see we like just this, see yeah it's and the it's, horizon yeah and, and it's really beautiful. And kind of Herzog's narration talks about how this is a heaven for pilots, yeah. which and that's how the original version ended. Now, the version you watched, so the version I watched was the Shout Factory uh, Blu-ray. But mm-hmm. you, interestingly, and we didn't even realize this till we kind of started comparing notes and talking about it. But the version that you watched on Amazon Prime uh, actually has a, a short postscript. Yeah. Which I was pretty surprised about mm-hmm. because uh, for a couple of reasons... Um, it, and I don't know what the history of the shooting is. I don't know who shot it, but you know, Herzog yeah, it's not said owns, who, who filmed it. Yeah. Herzog owns the film. I mean, from everything I understand, I couldn't imagine there's any way that somebody could have manipulated the content of this film without his approval. So mm-hmm. I'm sure that it was his design, but it's, it's not like most of Herzog stuff. It's, it's very there's not much the subjectiveness there, yeah. or commentary going on. It's very much kind of like a journalistic, just showing us some of the funeral in Arlington. Not Cemetery. shot on film either. Again, that's another point is that it's shot on video. So right. it's not like they got a film crew there. And, no. and so my my hypothesis was initially that because I, I wouldn't be surprised if Herzog was invited to Dengler's funeral because they were friends. Could be. Yeah. Um. So that so I was wondering, you know, Likely. perhaps it was Herzog just going to pay his respects and and 
putting that at the end of his film to kind of as a bookend could be um but i also don't again we don't know there's no there's no record of who like nobody's talking about in the camera you don't see herzog at the funeral so it's no. not clear. and there's no narration there's um, no there's no narration like it, yet it's just I there's said, just title very... cards of like describing that he died and that yeah. he got a uh, f-14 tomcat flyover at the funeral and that he was you know Arling in arlington yeah. um and i don't know the laws or the rules around filming at arlington i don't know what the restrictions on that are so perhaps this was the only way that herzog was able to get any footage of it or perhaps again yeah. it was just somebody else and herzog managed to just acquire that footage and, and put it in um an alternate version for the I dvd think I, release yeah i think you know we may never know the answers to those questions but i think yeah. one thing it definitely does speak to uh and i think it's a it's a fair thing to say uh, you know, Herzog does, is not like Lucas. You know, he doesn't go back and mess no, with his films no, no. once they're done. So I think I think it shows it, it likely shows what high regard and how much respect and what an impact Dieter had on Herzog that he would go back and do this. Yeah, that's that's my thinking. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I and I and, you know, you take that and, you know, plus the fact he made two films. So I, and it, no I mean, it, again, it, it clearly the fact that it, it is right after seeing this graveyard of planes and suddenly we are in a, you know, right. Peter's final resting place really suggests that there is a carryover again, had there been sort of more, it had it been planned with the movie, like had Dieter died before the production of this movie was completed, because of course this movie was shot and released in 1997. Dieter didn't right. die till 2001. So this edition came much later. Um, uh, but I think it was first seen in the 2004 DVD release. Um, but you get this sense that, you know, and you even mentioned this before in our, our kind of preliminary chat where it's like, you know, perhaps had this been something that happened before the film was, was completed, I could see Herzog and you, you mentioned this as well, Her Herzog utilizing, um, the like rows of crosses in Arlington to kind of uh, juxtaposed against the rows of planes waiting yeah. for the graveyard. So very similar, you know, it's yeah. very clearly not something that was obviously because he wasn't dead before the release of this movie but very clearly something that wasn't you know didn't have a lot of money thrown at it to kind of put it on this ending and i could see it very <laughs> much being just kind of herzog's final tribute to that's uh, what i think i think it's friend. just a yeah. out of respect for a friend i it felt yeah. personal and yeah and, and 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 like we said we'll never know but that's kind of what it felt like to me well mm -hmm. All right. Well, I think we're at the end of another uh, episode, yeah, man. Lots of which fun. is it's amazing how they fly by, and uh, I can't believe it's like blowing my mind that we're on 26 episodes, and uh, uh, that's just awesome. It's been a fun experience, and I hope people out there have enjoyed listening to it. I look forward, Cullen, for our next episode, mm -hmm. uh, Rescue Dawn. That's going to be exciting, and it'll be uh, a unique experience to compare two different films on the same subject. Yeah, uh, We've not gotten to do that on the podcast yet, and uh, so I'll be excited for that. But everybody, thank you so much for hanging in there with us. I hope yeah. you enjoyed it, uh, and we will catch you next time. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone.